Hi again, it's Christina from Sunshine and Flora. So this is my cut flower Q&A video. Last week I did a YouTube short post and I also posted on the community tab asking for your questions about growing cut flowers. So I have compiled quite a list of questions from you guys. So this should be really fun. I will try to answer these to the best of my knowledge. Just a little backstory on my growing. I am going into my third official season growing cut flowers. I sell them at our local farmers markets. I do special orders. I have a florist that I supply to and I have a bakery about 20 minutes away that I do deliveries to. So last year was a really big year in growing and I hope that 2023 I can grow and expand even more. My plans for this year are to double my growing space. I'm putting up a hoop house. Um, I am growing so many more plants than I ever had before so it should be a really exciting year. Um, but anyway, let's dive right into the questions. Now, these are in no particular order. I literally copied and pasted and typed them all out in the order they came in. I don't see a lot of overlapping questions, so this should be really fun to go through these. All right, so the first question is from Judy, and she says, what are your most important fillers, and will you be able to anchor your hoop house in the ground in the spring if the ground is frozen? Well, first of all, with the hoop house, if the ground is frozen, no. So I will have to wait till the ground is unfrozen, most likely, to anchor in my hoop house. The hoop house that I ordered, and I did a whole video on this, is from Grower Solutions. It is a 16 by 28 hoop house. The anchors for it are posts that will go probably about two feet into the ground. Um, so I will need to wait until the ground thaws. I do have an area prepared in my parking lot where we have already had a skid loader come in and scrape the gravel off of the area so it is ready to start. I first will be bringing in a load of dirt and then compost and that will create the foundation for where the hoop house will go. Um, but yes, I will have to wait until the ground is thawed. I'm hoping we have an early spring. Maybe I can put down some concrete blankets to help um, move along that process but we'll just see how it goes. I really would have liked to have it in this fall but that just didn't happen. So you know how those things go in the gardening world. Then Judy also asked, what are your most important fillers? Last year, the most important filler that I used was Bupleurum, and it was absolutely amazing. It was a little tricky starting from seed, but I learned a process, so I will be starting it very um, much more easily this year, so I will make sure to share that with you guys. I did the first succession planting, and I had a really great harvest off of it. Then I direct sowed it and got a second succession planting, got a great harvest off of those then my first succession planting actually started flushing growth again and I got more blooms off of that succession planting so really I got um, three different harvest off of two different plantings and this year I plan to plant um, three or four plantings of Uplurum because it worked so well it had a great vase life I absolutely loved it um, another important filler that I will be really growing mainly for the first time this year will be cress and I am really excited to try that one out. Okay, so the second question is from Anne, and she says, how did you decide to grow cut flowers? What are your favorite flowers and do you buy plugs or start them from seed? Um, so I start everything from seed. I have the last few years. I have multiple videos on everything that I start from seed. Now this year I did order plugs from Farmer Bailey just to try them out. Um, when you order from Farmer Bailey, you have to order in certain increments so that you fill your boxes. So I ordered 125 plug trays and I had to order three to fill a box. So I ordered um, one plug tray of Lysianthus and two plug trays of stock. I I just want to see how that goes and maybe next year I will be ordering more plugs um, but otherwise everything else I start from seed. So then Anne asked what are your favorite flowers and I actually just put out a video on my top 10 cut flowers um, so I will make sure to link that down below but at the top of my list was sunflowers and then also at the top of my list is zinnias. I can start both of these from seed or I can direct sow them. They grow easily. Um, they bloom a lot of the season. Now sunflowers I do have to succession plant but they are a strong grower in my area. 
Any bouquet that I have a sunflower in always sells. Um, also dahlias. Any bouquet that I have a dahlia in, it always sells. So I would say those are probably my top three, but make sure to check out that video on my top 10 cut flowers. Then she first asked, how did you decide to grow cut flowers? So I have always been a gardener. Um, my mom always grew flowers. My grandma did. My dad always had a vegetable garden. So I've kind of always been involved in the gardening. Um, after high school, I went away to college, so I never had a garden there. But when I moved home, started my job, I bought a house. Um, I had a garden in the backyard where I grew my vegetables, and I always had flower planters around. Um, I decided to grow cut flowers three years ago because here at my photography studio, when I purchased this building, there was an empty lot next door where there had originally at some point been a building that got tore down. And that lot was pretty much kind of grass and weeds. So I purchased that lot and I originally put a couple raised beds along the south side of my building here that I was going to plant sunflowers and zinnias in and some daisies, thinking that I would be able to use some of that for photo shoots like for senior photos. Well, then I decided I wanted to make the whole lot a garden. So um, I think it was in 2020, probably when we all were watching way too much YouTube because we were home so much because of COVID, um, I decided to put a fence across the front of the lot to block it off from the front sidewalk and highway. I tilled the entire lot up, I made pathways, and then half of the garden was vegetables and half of the garden was cut flowers. I kind of have always wanted to do something with the farmer's market, so I decided I'm gonna grow varieties that I can grow to sell at the local farmer's market for cut flowers. I did, I started in July and went every other week, and I kind of just became addicted and realized I absolutely loved it. So. It's just pretty much snowballed from there. There was no one else doing cut flowers in my town or at my local farmer's market. Um, so it was kind of just a niche that I sailed right into and it has been so fun and rewarding and now I can't imagine not doing it. So there's a really long answer to your short question. Okay, so the next question is from Tori, and she says, would love to hear more about your pricing strategies for profit. Do you break down the cost of seeds and plugs, growing supplies, travel? How do you determine if a new project is too costly or risky versus knowing it's the right time to grow your business, even though you're going to be taking a financial investment? So pricing, I do not break down, well, Okay, so when I come up with my pricing per stem for my cut flowers, I go off of the wholesale pricing online. So one of the most common um, websites that I am aware of for doing this is the um, Boston Cut Flower Market Wholesale Pricing. Google it, you can look um, at their pricing. They update it on a weekly basis and Yes, Boston is a big city. I live in a small town, but it's actually very comparable. Um, so that is kind of the pricing that I have gone off of in the past. I know a lot of other people will find one of their local flower wholesalers in their area that their actual florists buy from. They look at their pricing and they kind of go off of that as well. So then as far as um, how you decide how to price your bouquets because obviously you need to charge more for a custom bouquet versus how you are charging for what you sell to a florist. That tends to be a little regional. You know, you can double your stems or you can look at what your florist sell for stems. Um, I am in a very small town so I cannot sell my bouquets for as much for as like our uh, Des Moines, our state capital can sell for, or a big city, you know, a couple hours away, um, or like Minneapolis. Um, I am in Northwest Iowa, so my small town cannot be Minneapolis prices. Um, so how you price has to be a little regional as well, but I always think that the wholesale pricing is a very, very good starting point. So either look up your florist wholesalers, become a member, and look at their prices, or look at that Boston market price. Then she says, how do you determine if a new project is too costly or risky? So I would say, so for example, when I decided that I wanted to put in a hoop house this year, 
I needed more growing space. And one of the areas that I wanted to try to expand was growing earlier season crops and trying to grow later in the season. So a hoop house just made sense for me. So I look at um, the size of the hoop house that I put in, what flowers and what products can I put in that hoop house? How much could I potentially earn over the season in that hoop house? So how many Lysianthus can I fit in a row and what can I sell those for? I think by putting in this hoop house, I can make my money back in one season. So that easily is a good investment for me. Um, you know, it depends on what project you're going to do the size of the project, the cost of the project. Um, but, you know, so it's just gonna depend on you. But I would say if you want to decide if it's um, beneficial for your farm, see potentially how much money you can make in the first season or first two growing seasons and see if you can make that money back. Um, I don't know if that's the right answer, but that's how I decided on my expansion project. So I hope that helped you. So Kelly says, any tips for selling at the farmer's market for the first time? Um, so farmer's markets is kind of the first easy way that a lot of people will market their cut flower business. I would say, first of all, see if there's anyone else that is selling cut flowers at your farmer's market. Um, if there isn't, go for it because you will be able to sell flowers at your farmer's market easily if no one else is selling. Um, if there is someone else selling at your farmer's market, see if they are solely selling cut flowers or if it's like a vegetable farmer that just happens to have some zinnias and sunflowers in their garden that they're just putting as an extra in their booth. Um, you want to be able to offer something different than what that person is selling. So you know, whether it's mixed bouquets, whether it's larger bouquets, um, whether you're growing dahlias and selling, you know, a little more specialty bouquets. I sell $15 bouquets at my farmer's market. They always almost sell out. Um, last year, I decided to add $5 mini bouquets. Those also sold out. I had children coming up and buying them for moms. Um, I had some people that just wanted a little flowers every week, but maybe didn't want to spend $15 every single week. So they would buy the $5 bouquets. So I think it's also good to offer a couple different options. Last year when my snapdragons were blooming like crazy in my garden, I offered $10 snapdragon bouquets. It was eight or nine stems for $10. Those really sold well. So I would just say, you know, scope out your market and see what currently is happening. And then make sure to make your booth very appealing and colorful. I'll put a picture of my booth up on the screen. You can see I have multiple bouquets. Um, display it. I have a colorable tablecloth. I have a little sign uh, because that will be very eye-catching to people coming into the market and it will direct them right to your booth. All right, so Melinda says, I'm looking at selling bouquets at a local bakery or coffee shop. Do you have any advice for me? So that's her first question. Um, I would say reach out to some local um, bakeries or coffee shops and see if that is something that they are interested in. Um, if you are, you know, already looking into that, maybe that is something that you have already done, but then you also want to make sure that you have a very clear, a plan in mind as far as pricing. So there's a couple different ways that you can go about this. Um, sometimes you can sell on commission or sometimes they will, buy straight from you and then sell for another price um, that they determine. So uh, you basically you wanna make sure it's worth it. Is it a local bakery or do you have to deliver? Do you have to figure your driving time in there? Um, you obviously are going to not be selling these for full retail price. You're almost going to be selling these for more a wholesale price. So for example, the bakery that I sell to, she sells $20 bouquets, but I sell them to her about what the wholesale value is. So more like $12. So I want to make sure to take enough bouquets there that it is worth it for me. Or could I be selling these bouquets, um, out of my front door and I don't have to take them somewhere. The one really good thing about selling in another local business is all the faces that come into that business, they're gonna see those bouquets, they're going to hear about your business, and then those could be potential sales in the future. So, you know, if you're really trying to get the word out about selling cut flowers um, and 
if you're a new cut flower farmer, selling in another business is a really good way to at least get the word out about your business for a couple years. And then maybe in the future, you've grown so big, you don't take um, flowers to that business in the future, if that makes sense. So it can be a really good business building uh, platform to start from. So Melinda also asks, also I am trying to fit cut flowers and greenery into my landscape. Do you have any suggestions for the best cut flowers or greenery for growing into landscape? I love your videos and it always makes me excited to work in my garden. Oh, thank you, Melinda. So I also grow cut flowers in my landscaping at home and in a cottage garden landscape area here. The ones that I grow in my landscape area are yarrow, echinacea, um, daisies. These are all perennials. I always think perennials are really easy to put in landscaping because they come back every year and then you don't have to replant those areas. Um, I all, what do I grow? What else do I grow? Uh, cosmos, I put a line of cosmos along a fence line in my cottage garden area and those always fit in really well. I grew Rebecca in my landscaping, which is a perennial. Um, annuals that I can easily tuck in my landscaping are marigolds, um, celosia. I put gomfrina in my landscaping. Those are all really easy landscaping plants for me. Another one that's really easy to grow in your landscaping, but when you plant it, you do have to wait a few years to harvest off of it, are peonies. So I have peonies around my house at home that I um, cut off of for bouquets. So that is a really easy one to fit in your landscaping. Okay, so Brooke says, what advice do you have on starting hard to germinate seeds like celosia, bells of iron, and eucalyptus? These are ones I seem to struggle with. I dabbled last year on jumping in this year. What are your favorite fillers and focals and greens? So I kind of already covered my favorite um, fillers and focal flowers and greenery. Um, again, make sure to watch my video on my top 10 cut flowers that I just posted. Hard to germinate seeds. I have never had problems with germinating celosia. I grow a lot of the Selway series. That is always my favorite. Um, I've grown the Pompous Plume mix. Uh, I have covered these in videos in the past for seed starting, but you want to make sure to follow the directions on your seed starting package. Always put a humidity dome over your seed starting tray to keep them moist and definitely put a heat mat under your tray because they will need heat to germinate. Um, eucalyptus, I have never had luck with eucalyptus. I think it is just really, really hard to start. So that might be something that maybe you want to buy starts for or plugs for. Um, Bells of Ireland, I have never started from seed, although I am this year for the first time. I have seen people using the paper towel and a plastic bag method for starting those. So that's my plan this year. When I do that, I will make sure to do a video, but basically I think this is what you do. Um, don't quote me on it, but you put your seeds in a wet paper towel, you place it in a plastic bag, and then you set it aside and you let the seeds actually germinate in that wet paper towel. Once you see growth on those seeds, then that is when you put those into your soil. That's the method I'm gonna be trying out this year, um, so stay tuned for that. I will make sure to keep you posted because Bells of Ireland is something I really, really wanna grow in my garden. All right, Spreading Honey Flower Farm said, you mentioned that you are a photographer. Has your photography business and your flower farm business mix well together or do you keep them separate? That's a really good question. So I have been a full-time photographer with my studio for almost 20 years. So Cut Flower Farming is a side business that I started just a few years ago. Um, I pretty much keep them separate, although my photography clients are learning now that I grow cut flowers. I use my cut flower area for photography, um, for some senior photos, for some kids photos. I photograph my daughter in there. Um, I don't market my cut flowers like I market my wedding photography. I actually am photographing less weddings because I'm hoping that my cut flower income will kind of fill my wedding income. Um, so I don't, you know, if I'm photographing a wedding, I don't say, hey, I sell cut flowers. Can I do your wedding flowers? I do not do that because I think that the wedding industry, um, 
you know, bouquets, boutonnieres, like I think that's a whole separate thing and I do not want to be that professional that does that. Um, I have had like wedding showers ask me to do arrangements for the table or they'll buy like a bucket of flowers to make their own arrangements. I will do that, but um, I pretty much keep it separate. Uh, I do have flowers on display and if someone asks, I would say, oh, I grow cut flowers, but um, for the most part, I pretty much keep it separate. I do think my photography has helped market my cut flowers because the knowledge that I have to photograph my bouquets and my flowers for like my socials, my Instagram and my Facebook and also my website, I think that that has really helped. All right, so last question on this typed up page is from Amy, and she said, what advice do you have for someone going to their first flower farming year and farmer's market? And then Andrea commented, I'm echoing in on this one, going to the market, set up step by step. What do you bring? How do you transport everything? How do you set up? Do you bring water complete for newbies? Um, so I kind of already touched on the topic, like what advice do you have for the first year for going into a farmer's market? But I'll kind of go over everything that I bring and kind of my setup. And this might be a good idea for a video. So I think maybe around June, I'll make a note in my calendar to do a video on my whole farmer's market setup. Because I know the first year I was doing my farmer's market, my booth um, has evolved so much since that first time I did my setup. Um, so basically, and I will put another picture up on the screen as I go through this. I'll put pictures for my local farmer's market and then the big end of the year market that I do. But basically, um, I take either a four or six foot table for my setup. I always try to have a bright colored tablecloth because I feel like people walking into the market, that really catches their eye. It also really um, blends and accents the flowers that I have on display. I also try to have a tiered display. So I will have um, buckets or jars on my table, but then I will take a wooden crate to elevate at least something because I feel like if you can have a tiered display, that just also makes your booth stand out um, even more. If you have business cards for your cut flower business, I always think it's a good idea to put out the business cards because then that's a way that people are able to contact you later on to place orders. One other thing I always take along is a little box of baggies. So just like the plastic sandwich bags, not the Ziploc, but the open top. Every time someone buys a bouquet, I give them one of those baggies on the bottom of it just so when they're transporting it home, it doesn't drip or get wet on their car seat and then that also protects the stems a little bit. I always have a tent to cover my display because I think it's really important to keep my area shaded because I don't want that direct sunlight and heat on my flowers. So I have a 10 by 10 pop-up tent that I take for my market. I also have one that I am able to set up by myself because I don't always have one that can help me set up. So I will link it down below in the video, but the one that I have um, has this uh, circle thing in the middle. I'm probably not going to describe this very well, but I can go underneath of the tent and push that up and it clicks and then I can lift the sides up and I can set this tent up in like one or two minutes by myself. So it's really easy. And one other thing for your pop-up tent, you always want to make sure that you have sandbags to go on the corners to weight them down. Because let me tell you, you get one gust of wind and that is going to launch into the air so fast. It has totally happened to me. Uh, let's see, what else do I take? Um, um, she asked water. Yes, all my flowers are in water buckets it, at the market because you want to make sure to keep them nice and fresh. Um, all of my flowers that I sell at the market do not come with vases or jars. And so I have three to four bouquets per bucket. I buy the black 10 liter buckets from Johnny's. Um, they're standard size or there's wide size. I like them both. Sometimes I actually like the wide ones better. So I have, um, you know, a couple inches of water in the bottom and then my wrapped bouquet sit in there. You want to make sure that the water is not high enough that it touches the paper on your bouquet because then that paper is just going to soak up the water. And when you hand it to the customer, um, it just doesn't look as nice. Um, the mini bouquets, I tend to display them in single mason jars. Um, what else? So... What else do I take to my market? Um, 
I always have a sign. I started off by just having a little sign displayed um, on the table of my tent. This year I bought a chalkboard easel sign and I put the prices on that. I thought that was a really great addition. I take payment with cash or Venmo. I always keep my payment in even numbers. So if I am selling a $15 bouquet, they pay me $15 that day. But then when I'm entering in, into my QuickBooks, I subtract the tax after that. So I'm always paying tax on everything I sell. But when I sell at the market, um, I feel like it's so much easier for them to pay me an even amount. If I would charge tax on top of the $15, it would be $16.05. Well, then they're going to have to find a dollar and a nickel. I think it's easier for them just to give me $15 cash. But you always want to make sure to record your sales tax when you're actually doing your accounting. And one last thing about taking payments, you always want to make sure to have plenty of change with you. Um, I usually take some ones, but mostly five and tens. And then that way I have plenty of change to make people if they pay me in cash. Um, I think that that is probably about it for my simple market setup. The big end of the year market that I do, I do a 10 by 20 booth. I have multiple tables. I have so much more product like that is a huge, huge setup. Um, so for that, I will use my easel sign in the front and then I usually get a banner that I hang um, behind me in the booth because the, I want my logo a little more visible because there's just so much more product. Um, that I do jelly jar arrangements, I do wrapped bouquets. They're priced at 15 and $25. And then I also take um, about, this year I took 250 to 300 specialty pumpkins. So just a much bigger deal, but um, like a really good end of the season uh, way to end my season. I just absolutely love it. As far as transporting my flowers, that wooden crate that I use to elevate them up, I will put a bucket in there with some of my supplies and that goes in my car. Um, the other flower buckets that I have go in this big Tupperware or like Rubbermaid container. I can fit three buckets of flowers in there easily. So I just put the flowers in there and lift that in and out of my car. Um, when I'm doing my bigger market, I have to use boxes and then I have these certain um, styrofoam packing material things that came with all of the jelly jars that I ordered. I save all that and so I can put like 15 of those in one big box and they won't tip over. Um, you have to get really creative when you're transporting because you definitely don't want your flowers getting damaged or falling over. But the big plastic containers holding the buckets work great for me for the market and that's how I'll transplant flowers to my florist and to that bakery that I deliver to. And then the first part of her question was asking about going into the first year flower farming. I think the one really important thing to remember is don't overgrow or overplant what you can't handle. In your first year, it's really just about learning what you like, what you need. So I would say pick a few key varieties and try those out and then each year add a little more. Um, so pick, you know, three or four focal flowers, a few accent flowers, and maybe one or two fillers and start with that. You can always grow more the next year. And then that way, if there's something you really like, you can expand on it. If you didn't really like it, just don't grow it the next year and try something different. You don't want to overdo it the first year and be overwhelmed and then you don't have a good result with anything. So I would say start small and you can always expand and grow every single year. Okay, so we are on to page two of my questions. I have a feeling I'm going to have to break this up into a two-part video, um, which is great because I love the amount of questions that I got from you guys. All right, so Renee said, how do you know your profits with all the time that goes into it? Do you keep an expense report? I hope your hard work is paying off. Oh, it is. Um, have you always done photography and then added in the flower business? So yes, I kind of went over that um, a little bit already. The first question though about recording an expense report, I use QuickBooks um, for my photography business and so I have separate accounts set up in that QuickBooks that go specifically for the flower business for my cost of goods and all my expenses. So at the end of the year when I print out my profit and loss report, I can see everything that goes for my photography business as far as income and expense and everything for the flower business for income and expense. So Geo says how to work out pricing stem for 
direct to customer sales versus florists. So I kind of already went over this a little bit as well, um, but I either, typically I will look up um, the Boston Wholesale Market pricing and then I go from there for florists. When you are selling to florists, you typically sell your flowers in bunches of 10, some are sold in bunches of five. So um, like if she buys Snapdragons, I will sell a bunch of 10. If it's sunflowers, those are usually bunches of five. And sh basically um, last year when I was working with my florist, I would contact her and I would say, here is what I have. And so I would give her, you know, all the list of varieties that I had um, that I could harvest that day. And I always would send her the list like on Monday and then um, she would either come pick them up or I would deliver them to her on Tuesday. So she would say, I want um, 10 Snapdragons, 20 Zinnias, 10 Celosia, five Sunflowers, whatever. So then I would look at the current wholesale pricing and based on her list, I would say, you owe me X amount of dollars. So um, Snapdragons were, if I remember right, $1.50 a piece. And so $15 for the bunch of Snapdragons, $10 for 10 Zinnias, um, you know, $10 for five Sunflowers. So that is how um, you would price them out for florists. Then customer sales, I kind of already went over that. You definitely price your bouquets higher than wholesale pricing um, because you're selling retail price and you're putting them together. Um, flower arrangements is even more because you are designing them. If they go in a vase, you need to figure out the price of your vase. It can be a little regional, you know, city versus small town. So that's kind of just something you have to figure out but wholesale pricing is definitely a baseline to start with. Shannon says, can you please walk me through how you harden off cool flowers that are started inside under grow lights? Yes. Is it the same process for warm weather flowers? Yes, pretty much. This is my first time starting hardy annuals and I feel out of my depth. Hardy annuals are so easy, don't be scared. So I harden all of my seedlings off that go into my garden. Um, so on the back of your seed packet, it will always tell you when to start your seeds. So six to eight weeks before your last frost date, eight to 10 weeks before your last frost date. So you wanna make sure to follow those directions. Now hardy annuals, um, so like snapdragons, lisianthus, yarrow, there is a whole lot of them. They can actually be planted out in the ground before your last frost, not a hard freeze, but your last frost. So you also want to make sure that you harden enough. So hardening, hardening them off basically means you're acclimating them to the outside um, temperatures and climate because they are so used to being inside under your grow shelves, you don't wanna directly put them outside to that fluctuation in temperature or wind exposure because that can really be hard on those seedlings. So basically, um, one of the easy ways that you can start prepping them is to have a fan in your grow room. And just that fan oscillating in your grow room for a few hours a day will strengthen the stems on your seedlings. Now when I get ready to harden them off, I will move them off of my grow shelves and I will gradually set them outside longer every day. So um, maybe I'll put them out for two hours a day and then the next day I'll put them for three hours. And then by the end, um, I usually do this over maybe a 10 day period they'll be outside during the day inside at night or outside during the day and then in my greenhouse at night so that just a little bit at a time will acclimate them to that climate and then when you plant them out it's not such a shock on those plants all right so Christina says another Christina hello over the past year, I've been following you and many other popular flower farmers on YouTube. Do none of you grow Gerber daisies? They're such a popular flower in florists and store bouquets, and I personally love the look of them. Why do you not grow Gerber daisies? I know what you mean. You see them a lot with florists, and you see them like in the grocery stores during the winter. Um, I have never tried to grow them from seed. I have years ago bought some plants, um, like when I'm going to buy my annuals, like petunias and things like that, that I pot in flowers. I did at one time buy some Gerber daisies. I remember them dying off very quickly for me. I can't remember if it was a bug issue 
or um, like a disease issue, but I remember trying them a couple different years and they just would not grow for me. So um, I'm wondering if in my area they just don't grow well and maybe they're more suited for like a warmer tropical climate. I honestly don't see flower farmers growing them um, either. And I do think they're beautiful, but I just wonder if they're really tricky. Um, yeah, I don't, I guess I really don't have a really good answer for that. Um, I just know with my experience buying a plant to try to grow in a planter years ago, they did not work well for me. All right, so Positively for Breakfast says fertilizer. What do you use? What do you use on seedlings, plants? How do you water your beds and your new hoop house? So fertilizer that I put down when I prep my beds, I always put compost or an organic raised garden mix in. I also use a Biotone starter fertilizer when I amend my beds. Um, in my seedling trays, I use either the Espoma Grow or... Um, a fish emulsion fertilizer. I will link, I should say all of the products that I use will be linked in the description to this video so you can easily buy them online. Um, seedlings I always fertilize once a week at half strength and then when I plant my seedlings out in the ground I try to remember to fertilize them. I'm not very good at fertilizing them once they are actually in the ground, but I do try to fertilize them once they are in the ground, full strength with the fish emulsion fertilizer. Um, but the compost and that starter fertilizer that I put in my beds, I actually think do a pretty good job um, of getting them going throughout the year. Um, watering um, my hoop house, I will be using a hose to water that. I had one bed last year that I ran drip irrigation in. It worked awesome. Um, the rest of my growing area, I honestly rely on rain or I water it with a hose. This year I do plan to run maybe more drip or soaker hoses to water part of it. Um, so I will make sure to keep you guys updated on that. MM said, I'd love to hear any tips on your experience growing ranunculus, eucalyptus, and basils, um, and any other plants you cut from your growing list. Thank you. She also says, thank you for doing this. I love following along on your flower journey. Um, then she has a couple other questions. So I'm going to address the experience from with um, the first questions. So eucalyptus, I tried to start from seed. I just not did not have any luck. So I just cut it from my list. Um, basil, I grew a ton of basil. I grew a whole bed of basil last year because I thought I would love it as a filler. I did not. Um, <laughs> I had a problem with it wilting, which is one reason I didn't like to use it. I also found, and people probably are gonna think I'm crazy for saying this, I also found that the scent was a little too much for me. Um, I think it's so recognizable as an herb. For me, I just don't know that I loved using it in a cut flower bouquet. So I think fillers, I'm going to use all other fillers and not basil. So last year, I really wish I would not have used that bed space for basil because I could have utilized it so much better, but I learned my lesson for this year. Um, in Rinoculus, Rinoculus, um, my fail with Rinoculus last year was um, one area did not get as much sunlight as I thought it did, and so it just didn't grow well there. And I planted it out exactly when I wanted to plant it out, and we had really cool temperatures, which was totally fine because I was able to cover it with frost cloth, and it was looking great, and then all of a sudden, we got super hot weather, like 90s, 100s, and it was too hot too fast for my ranunculus. So it fried and pretty much died off. Um, this year, all of my ranunculus will be grown in my hoop house where I can plant it out earlier and hopefully take advantage of those cooler temperatures. And I'm hoping that it will thrive in there. Um, the second part to MM's questions were, how did you or do you go about selling to bakeries and florists? So I kind of went over all of that already. And what outlets or marketing have you gotten sales from? So um, I sell four different places. I sell at the farmer's market. I sell direct um, orders, private order, or 
I sell um, special orders. I do the florist and the bakery. So the bakery, she was a friend of mine. I contacted her and asked her if she would be interested. She immediately jumped on that response. And so that was just something we tried out. Um, we found that every week was too much, but every other or every third week was about perfect. Um, the florist, I already went over that. I've gone over the farmer's market and then special orders. Basically, I just put started putting the word out over social media that I was growing cut flowers. And I, um, you know, put out there that I would be at our local farmer's market every Tuesday, or I would take other special orders, like usually towards the end of the week. So um, basically people will call, text, or Facebook message me, you know, they need, um, an order for so-and-so for Friday pickup. So then I basically just say, how much do you want to spend and make the order based on that? I also have a certain customer that does two bouquets for pickup every Friday. And so I have that order to fill. So basically, being in my small town, word of mouth is a huge marketing way. And then social media, I have a Facebook page and an Instagram account. Um, and that is just how I get the word out there. I try to post, um, multiple times a week um, because I feel like you have to be consistent with the algorithms to keep seeing your um, post seen. Otherwise, no one's going to see your posts. So when I do my farmer's market every week, I post pictures of those. And then when I do special orders, I always try to post pictures of the special orders um, just for new content. Also on my website, there's a spot where you can sign up for a newsletter. It says subscribe at the bottom. So I have compiled a list of emails from that. I also took a sign up sheet to my local farmer's market so that people were able to sign up um, manually through that. And so I inputted those into my website and I try to send out a monthly newsletter to my subscribers with info just to kind of keep people up to date. Okay, so Broadman Farm and Garden says pesticides, even organic ones, seem to be a taboo topic of conversation. Totally agree on that. Um, I have so much insect pressure in my area. I can't imagine growing on a large scale without using some type of insecticide. What pest management practices do you use? Do organic pesticides have an effect on the cut flower vase life? So last year, I did not spray anything in my garden. I just felt like I didn't want to spray anything on the flowers that I was going to be selling to someone because not only would I be touching that, but they would be touching it. And I just felt like I didn't want to, you know, hide it from them that I wasn't, sp that I had sprayed it with something. I just wasn't comfortable with that. Um, so I did not spray anything. When I started having bug pressure, which was usually around August, I used organza bags um, to cover all of my flowers. Dahlias are always one that I have to cover. Um, so when I started seeing that bud start to open, I would put an organza bag on the bud. And then once the flower was ready to harvest, I would cut it and then move that bag onto another bud. Um, last year, I also had problems with my zinnias, which I did not have the year before. So I was, you know, I needed all the zinnias I could possibly get for my big end of the season market. So I was covering all my zinnias with bags as well. Um, I did find that some of the zinnias, like the cactus ones, covering them really didn't work because um, it would press the blooms easier than say my Benary's Giant. Um, so, those I just wasn't able to use. I did see that like the white zinnias and the green zinnias got eaten way more than like the dark red ones. So some of the dark red ones I didn't have to cover towards the end of the season. Um, but honestly, I didn't spray anything. Um, a lot of my plants weren't bothered by bugs. Some of them were and like some of my Rebecca were bothered and I, they just weren't usable. Um, so I would try the organza bag method and see if that works for you. I know that there are some um, homebrew methods that maybe you could try that are that may work, um, but honestly, I don't spray with anything. I just try to cover things and use what I can. Okay, so that is actually going to conclude part one of my Q&A series. I have two more 
full pages of questions and I just feel like that this video could be like an hour and a half long if I don't cut it right now. So this is going to be part one. I will be um, filming and editing part two and posting that very soon so make sure to watch for that. Thank you again to everyone that submitted questions and I can't wait to go over this second part of the questions. So watch for that video really soon. We'll see you soon.